Actually, but today, out of special um, uh, occurrence, we have one of our own talking, Dr. Jonathan Plumer, um, and uh, he's going to return to Germany. He had a very successful stint as our research fellow here, and he's returning back as a attending to the University of Bochum, to Bergmanns Heil, the largest uh, Central European trauma center, and one of the oldest, actually the oldest in the world. And so he's going to be an attending there. We're very proud to have had him and have paths crossed with him. And he's going to talk about something that he's worked on very hard, and that is uh, how do we kind of more formally approach spine infections, that is de novo spine infections, uh, infections of the disc space, of the epidural space, and of the vertebral column. And there's a lot of unstructured stuff that takes place, and we've asked him to kind of put together his thoughts in a formal presentation. As always, we like to start off with cases uh, that we've picked, and I'm here with my partners, Dr. Bob Hart and uh, Dr. Oskuyan, and we've uh, had three of our clinical fellows put together some cases from the last half year that hopefully illustrate some of the decision making, and we'll ask uh, young Professor Palmer, uh, he'll go back as an attending, as I said, to comment, so he may have to change his position, and we'll also ask him to introduce a new research fellow as uh, the day goes on. Thank you all for joining us today, and we're curious to hear Okay, looks like we have Lahore also. Good morning, or good afternoon to you. So um, we'll start with Dr. Jim Hicks, and he has a first case going, and to get us started, and I think it's a simple discectomy that had problems. Yes. Dr. Hicks, and again, Happy New Year to everybody, and here's Dr. Hicks. Happy New Year to all of you, Jens, all the colleagues at the Seattle Science Foundation. All right, thank you. Um, Hello to you. Thank you for joining us. Happy New Year. Congratulations to Jonathan as well. Um, all right, Stead Talk. I'll oh, just quick go dogs there. Um, so, uh, Mr. A, he is a 58 year old male, Stas Post L45 discectomy, and now IND, secondary to surgical site uh, infection. Uh, presents to our facility with progressive low back pain radiculopathy with ambulation. Uh, he has completed his course of urtapenem. Um, this is for a Morganella species uh, isolated after his IND. And he has completed this. Um, his sons uh, complain that he is now essentially non-ambulatory and too painful to ambulate. So let's let's talk about this for a second. Do you have the images of that first discectomy? I know you don't have the pre-op, but the post-op? Yes. So show us that. Um, so quickly, he just has some dorsiflexion weakness. And here's our film review from the outside hospital, starting on the left, be after yeah. that first. Yeah, I'd hope you'd just show the first on the left. Uh, sorry, this did not come across in translation. So discitis after a simple discectomy. When we have a patient, it's very, very rare. Let's, uh, let's go to Dr. Hart. Uh, let's say we did a simple discectomy. The patient gets a deep soft tissue infection. Should we wash out the disc space also? Do we have to kind of do something for the disc space or not? Well, I haven't uh, historically I don't know if that's on. Uh, yeah, there it is. I haven't uh, historically uh, done that necessarily. I think, um, you know, if you got in there and you're doing your IND and you're poking around and you've got uh, pus oozing up around the fecal sac, then uh, yes, I would absolutely do it. Um, you know, I suspect this may have been a case that the actually the disc was seated uh, during the operation rather and may have been the ultimate or initial source of the whole infection. I'm not sure. But, mm -hmm. um, Rod, what are your thoughts? So you have a, it's extremely rare. Uh, official statistics say about half a percent of uh, discectomies without any complications go on to a deep SSI. Should we wash out the disc space? Yes or no? I think um, in this case, how far out is he again? So this is no, just, just in general, just in general. Don't, don't mean, think about the sequence that Dr. Hicks kind of spilled the beans on. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, in general, uh, you know, it's um, again, it depends on the case and how 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 bad the infection is. But yeah, in general, you want to go in and wash it out. So you would, okay, Tariq, an in initial infection after simple discectomy. Do you wash out the disc space? Yes or no? 
Okay, we're not live. So let's go to Dr. Plumer. So Dr. Plumer, if you just yeah. concentrate on the left side, I know it's hard because we have everything out here. Um, I'm not gonna obsess about that anymore. Uh, on that left only, there's obviously a bright disk signal, something is wrong there. Um, does this constitute already a discitis in terms of what you look at? This is not a de novo discitis, it's a post-surgical discitis. How do you address this in terms of categorizing it? I mean, um, yeah, uh, there is, uh, for me, that's an abscess to the disc, but um, uh, addressing it, um, we came up with the side score, um, but this even is not a de novo infection, so we cannot use the side score for this, but uh, I mean, we can talk about the, the, the components you should use to, to evaluate the, the decision of doing surgery or not. And I mean, this patient, he has an abscess to the disc, and um, concern, so concerning the location, it's kind of a mobile uh, part of the spine. So, um, and looking at the, uh, the, the clinic um, comorbidities, I don't know if he had a, like um, diabetes or if he was a drug user, but that could be a concern too. So yeah, for me, that would be an indication for, yeah, for surgical treatment. And in, in, the, in the case of yeah, uh, post-operative um, infection, you should clearly in my opinion, wash out the disc and yeah, add stability to the segment. Now that's what I have a question. So what changes between, uh, you concentrated in your work that you're gonna present later on de novo infections. How does this apply to post-operative infections? Is there a transference? Can you just apply the same schemes from the uh, site score that you developed to post-operative infections? I mean, we cannot be sure about it because there's historically there's a big gap between these two entities because um, post-operative surgical site infection or surgical infection are treated with um, yeah with surgical treatment mm. and antibiotics, but the novo infection are basically or predominantly um, treated non-surgically. But we will talk about this in my in my presentation. But um, maybe we can just extrapolate our side score also to um, these post-operative infections, but still uh, part of ongoing uh, investigation, I would say. Dr. Hicks, so mm -hmm. um, what risk factors, Dr. Plumer talked about risk factors, what risk factors did this patient have on your chart biopsy? So he's, he's relatively healthy. Um, what does he do for a living? So I believe uh, you mentioned he was a fisherman. Yeah, he's sorts. a fisherman in Alaska. So, um, but otherwise, he was he was relatively healthy. Um, and how had he been how had he been treated? And this evolution of those three yeah. images, this is very disturbing to see. Yeah. What had been done? So based on uh, the sequence of the imaging, it was about a month after his uh, initial initial procedure, he underwent a debridement, and then subsequent weeks, uh, about one week after, based on what I could tell, um, so say one seven to. Uh, 113 and then to uh, 123 or so, uh, I think based on this imaging was, was the um, sequence of his operations from left to right. So what is the delta of days between or weeks between the leftmost image and the right image? Say on average about 10 days. Yeah. Wait, this is 10 days from one another. So from one to the next to the next. That would have been nice to so, put it down, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now we have, what's the problem on the right side? He can't get up anymore? Right, so he's, um, Essentially, he's having symptoms of mechanical instability. He can't get up. He's at bed rest. Mm -hmm. How's his infection doing? Is his wound draining? Um, so I did not see that in the chart, but I don't, I don't believe it's draining at that time. He had a picture that it was um, on arrival. The stitches were still intact, and there was no drainage that we could see. And neurologically, how did he do? So neurologically, he has a, um, a weak, he's weak dorsiflexion to one side. I believe that's the right side, um, objectively. So, Dr. Hart, what would you do? You, you're from Oregon, you've seen these, this is a horrible deterioration. There's mechanical instability, there's some neurology. Uh, I'm not sure about the, he has no direct wound infection, I'm not sure about his sepsis picture, sed rate CRP, he's not a known high risk patient. So what should we do now? I mean, this is obviously not, whatever has been done, uh, which is bed rest, IV antibiotics, um, has not worked. Well, I don't know if it, there's a change in the virulence of the organisms we're seeing, but I, I think this pattern of uh, outcome is increasingly prevalent. Uh, it feels to me like uh, 
we're seeing it more often. Uh, certainly the old paradigm of irrigation and debridement and IV antibiotics without necessarily stabilizing, um, uh, you know, has failed in this patient's case for sure. Uh, and uh, I think obviously at this point, there's no uh, treatment alternative that doesn't include a pretty substantial stabilization. Uh, uh, as I look at this, I think the images on the right in particular, I would be thinking two levels above. So I think that's L3, L4, and then screws, if we can get them in L5 and S1, and, and I would put pelvic screws in as well, and then a radical debridement of the disc space posteriorly. And I think I wouldn't fill it with a graft or a cage, but you know we've uh, used uh, PMMA regularly as a, an adjunct and uh, in, infiltrated with antibiotics, uh, which I think then helps both mechanically and uh, bacteriologically. Is it safe to put hardware in an infection? Yes, I, th I think, and that's also, you know, we sometimes get pushback from our ID colleagues. I think that it, they don't like the concept, but um, I think the experience has proven out that it's, uh, it's typically safe to do that. Um, yeah, so I, I think routinely, yes. Dr. Plumer, have you, uh, I know you did a research project on this. Are you going to talk about that later? Great. So we're going to defer a scientific assessment if it is safe to put hardware into an infected spine. I think uh, many people will be surprised as to the answer. Um, but so, Dr. Hicks, um, this is your patient. What would you do now after what you've seen here? Yeah, so I think uh, there's evidence of mechanical instability. Um, he uh, needs fixation, I think. Um, I think you need to sample that site intraoperatively. Um, and I think it's safe to put hardware, even if we suspect there is infection still present. What are the three hallmarks of non-surgical treatment of a spinal infection? Whether uh, Let's just ignore the post-operative part here mm -hmm. of a de novo spine infection. What are the three hallmarks, the three tenants? Um, well, first and foremost, you want to make sure there's no uh, compressive etiology. Um, so, that would... so there are three tenets, three tenets of non-surgical care. Ignore the okay. surgical uh, decompression part. So you want to know what bug you're treating. So traditionally, um, so sample you'll get entire spine imaging. Sample you'll... antibiotics. Right. So CT guided biopsy and then go ahead and target those antibiotics. Good. What's number yeah. two? Um, I don't know. Immobilization. You need to okay. immobilize this. This is a uh, structural element. Mm -hmm. Not talking about an epidural abscess now that is under attack. Mm -hmm. And that'll necrose, and necrosis infers instability that can renew the cycle, right? Sure. And number three is what? I don't know. Nutritional support. Great. All these patients usually have a very poor albumin. How does albumin or what nutritional factors uh, in your assessments have had an effect on successful treatment, Dr. Plummer? Um, yeah, besides yeah, albumin, we don't really have a good um, outcome parameter for uh, malnutrition, so albumin is the main, the main factor. Here. Of all of these three things, immobilization is usually mm -hmm. overlooked and uh, nutritional support is completely neglected. Mm -hmm. um, so targeted antibiotic therapy is very widely accepted, but immobilization is ignored usually mm -hmm. or not practical. Is L4-5 immobilizable with non-surgical means? Um, I think you could argue no. But no. Uh, unless you put the patient a TLHSO or hip spica mm. or keep the patient at bed rest, which he was for like a month. Mm. And nutritional support is also usually not yeah. done. Yeah. All right, take us forwards. All right, so here's his uh, CT. Uh, we've essentially already discussed some surgical management. So before I uh, spill the beans, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Dr. Plumer, so this patient for like almost two months had nothing but MRI scans and not a single CT. Why do we still get CTs? Why is that helpful and necessary? I mean, first of all, a lot of the reviews out there state that uh, MRI is the, uh, the yeah, main thing to do, but yeah, there is a lot of evidence that we should also do CTs. So uh, we can clearly see the bony erosion on the CT. Um, yeah, not the soft tissue, um, but the bony erosion in the CT, the, the sagittal uh, alignment, maybe we can, yeah, or maybe we can just judge the alignment better. But I mean, the, the main concern to do a CT is the bony erosion and the bony destruction, um, yeah, based on the infection itself. 
And here we can also see that the patient has a PARS defect below at L5, and we can see that the next higher level has a beginning discitis. We also can see that the patient has a dish tendency in the higher up levels at uh, whatever that's five, four, three, two, one, at lumbar one, two, is a, a dish evolution. Uh, but the main thing is we can see the host response. So this is all lysis. There's no osteoblastic reaction. So this is a compromised host, and he's still on the defensive. The infection is still gaining ground. There's not a organized healing response, okay? So that's why uh, we, we think that CT is absolutely necessary as a corollary to MRI scans. Agreed, Jim? Agreed. Dr. Oskuyan, what would you do here now? So. Uh, we see that there's extensive destruction. There's a beginning discitis at L34. The patient has a PARS defect. Do you feel comfortable putting hardware into this kind of a setting? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this needs what do you base I that think, on? debridement and stabilization. What well, do you base the hardware on in there? Um, clearly, clearly, this is unstable. So I think just going in and washing out is not going to do anything. Yeah. All right. So, Jim, take, a, take us forwards. All right. So, antibiotic space replacement at two levels there, a significant space inferiorly, uh, and we have a fixation from uh, to the pelvis. And um, so we did a quadruple rod construct mm -hmm. here. We put PMMA with um, tobramycin and vancomycin in there as inert spacers and as mechanical offloaders. Mm -hmm. And how are we doing? Is this going to fail? It's doing well. So I can uh, move forward to his... Um, just kind of a before and after in terms of the, the sagittal uh, component. So he's nice and stable there. Um, obviously, this done in the supine position originally. Uh, now, three months later, uh, he has bony formation anteriorly. So, he's doing well. Rod, so yeah. we do these PMA spacers as a temporizing high concentration local antibiotic delivery system, which is super physiologic uh, and it avoids uh, overloading kidneys or avoids ototoxicity and other unwanted side effects. This has not created any allergic side effects. We usually plan on taking those out and you and I, with your artistry and XLIF, you've taken some of those out for me and put spacers in. Look at what's happening in the front there, the patient's healing around the spacer. Does this patient need to have the cement block removed? No. I mean, as long clinically, as long as he's stable, we've left a lot of these in. Mm -hmm. As long as you get a fusion posteriorly, or a lot of times the bone goes through the cement. It doesn't go through the cement, but around yeah. the cement, like anteriorly. Bob, any thoughts? Take this out or not? Yeah, I, I don't. I think I would watch this one with this amount of bone formation. Did you put any biologic in there? I wanted to ask, or just uh, uh, we did. Just, I think a poster lateral fusion. Yeah. Did you look yeah. at that? Posterolateral, yeah. yeah. nothing just in the disc space. Lateral, but nothing yeah. in the disc space. Yeah. This is very thoroughly washed out with the laparoscopy, thoracoscopy, irrigator system. Right, right. Yeah, no, it looks great, and uh, yeah, I think as long as the fixation remains uh, solid, I would just watch this for now. Now we did a quadruple rod construct. If you go back a little bit, a short rod construct. Uh, uh, right around this uh, L4 to S1 section. We uh, went down to S1 because L5 is a very compromised vertebra. Mm -hmm. um, could we take the long spanning rod out um, and just rely on the short rod, or would you just leave everything in? Because it looks like there might be some early loosening around the pelvic screws. Yeah, I, I might do that. So I think uh, you could take out the L2 screws and the pelvic screws, and maybe the S1 screws, and then run your construct L3 to L5 as a final construct. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have a very similar case or that uh, involved TB that that's almost exactly what we did. Yeah, we're watching him, and he's apparently doing completely normal. He's actually been out on his boat uh, yeah. for the last couple of months, so... Um, Back fishing. Big difference. <laughs> So, so Rod, you before said you feel comfortable putting hardware in. Is there any paper that comes to mind that supports putting hardware into an acute ongoing infection? Uh, we have some good ones. Uh, specifically, I think uh, Jonathan's uh, publication mm -hmm. recently demonstrates that it's safe, effective, um, and uh, we have good long-term data. Great. So that's good. Okay, that's good. Anything um, else? Oh, yeah. So there, just a uh, quick article. Uh, out of JNS. So essentially this, uh, this PMMA strut has uh, been used in um, a case series that we've done here and uh, described in JNS. And so uh, nine of 15 uh, did return for stage two in terms of uh, not having enough bony formation. 
um, and they did have anterior cage placement. Um, 11 cured their infections. There were two recurrences and uh, two lost to follow up, but uh, overall, pretty good results. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, we'll go for right on Dr. Avila is coming up. And uh, welcome to Dr. Salam, uh, to Dr. Pirzad from the Afghanistan Neurosurgical Society. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you along with us, Dr. Pirzad. So, Dr. Avila has a different uh, kind of a slant on the case. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. First uh, step of the year. So this is a 65-year-old um, male with an extensive past medical history, as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, um, who initially presented at an outside hospital with back pain. Because of his history of kidney disease and kidney, disease and kidney stones, he he underwent a uh, x-ray they found a kidney stone the kidney stone was treated but the patient within about two weeks after said the back pain remained quite severe they put him on a brace and then eventually he made his way to a spine surgeon who said you fail your brace um you still have severe back pain um so let's do a kyphoplasty um again kidney stone hyperlipidemia gout diabetes, and stage renal disease, he's already on dialysis, and he was actually on the transplant list. Uh, sleep apnea, overweight, as you can see, quite, quite extensive <clears throat> past medical history. So this is from his original uh, studies. So on the left-hand side, you can see the plain x-ray where, where they saw that he may have a fracture, and that's the first MRI that they got right there in the middle. Uh, so you can see that's a stir image, some hyperintensity on the end plate, on the disc, and this was read as a compression fracture. And um, that's the reason the patient underwent this kyphoplasty that you can see there. Those are the intra pictures after the kyphoplasty. Some of that cement a little bit floating um, outside of the uh, vertebral body. And as I mentioned in the prior slide, this is what kind of started everything. This is now one month post kyphoplasty. The patient still has severe back pain. Uh, to this point, no neurological deficits, but severe back pain. Um, and uh, that's where they obtained this MRI. Mauricio, <laughs> was the patient attempted to be mobilized with a brace? Was there anything else done to try to help this patient get around? Right. So he had a brace before the kyphoplasty and after the kyphoplasty was still um, with the brace, the notes are quite unclear uh, how much he was mobilizing. He's, he seems like he was staying in bed quite a bit uh, from his, his chronic issues. Um, and then because he was still having severe back pain, that's when they got this new MRI within a month of that kyphoplasty. Did they get post-operative CT scans at some point in time? Not until this point, at least that we have available in our system. And the patient's neurologically normal? At this point, yes, sir. What do you think is going on in the epidural space? Is there a change in? the size of the epidural space, is there something forming there? I think there is. I, I, at the first month, you can see it already, and I'm just going to pull back. I'm uh, sorry. On the first one, you can see it was just a signal was on the um, L2 M plate, yeah, L2 M plate, and now you can see L1 M plate as well, hyperintensity. So there's, there's definitely something going on, uh, progressively going on. Using your cursor, can you just show the right-sided uh, T2 image and show what's going on behind it, just so people in the audience can see Oh, yeah. It. This is, but I, I was going to go there. This is okay. now three months. So this is one month after the kyphoplasty. He still has severe back pain. They see this. They said, mm, let's keep watching you. And then three months later, this is the new MRI where he still has severe back pain. So tell us what's going on in that epidural space. Just use that pointer to just yeah. express yourself. So it's a smaller screen here, so I go look okay. this way. So I'm already seeing, to me, this is already some epidural infection going on here. The stenosis at this level that you couldn't see here. Um, definitely that this space is compromised. You see some of the cement of the kyphoplasty, no longer, I think, the vertebral body now floating in the disc space. And the disc space is, again, high intensity signal. What does that mean? It's uh, to me, it's an inflammatory process. 
Um, and in this case, it's most likely an infection. There's fluid in there, there's water in there. Yep. So there's an abnormal transfer of standard collagen into something else right. underway. Yep. And again, no CTs were obtained, no upright x-rays were obtained. Nope. Is the patient mobile and walking around right now? What's happening? No, the patient is basically bed rest because of the pain. That's what the notes uh, are saying. Um, and with that, see, the three-month MRI, he goes back to uh, his original... So, sorry for interrupting. The patient is a transplant patient or a dialysis patient? Dialysis. Dialysis. So, he's on the transplant list. It's, oh, it's it, bad yeah. enough that he's, sorry, he's yeah. on dialysis on the transplant list. How is his uh, kidney maintained or function maintained? Is he uh, with a shunt? Is he... Um, no, he's on dialysis. Peritoneal on dialysis. And throughout, you'll see the history, he'll get a um, um, hemodialysis. Does he have a shunt infection? Uh, not Does at he this have a point. Fistula? No, no, because he doesn't have a fistula. He's just peritoneal dialysis. He'll get the fistula later for the Wait, hemodialysis. So he's getting peritoneal dialysis. Yes, at okay. this point, yes. So he goes, <clears throat> he goes back to his original surgeon at three months with that MRI we we're discussing, and then he decides to do a um, discectomy because the you know, I, I think we all agree that he has an infection. So this is about four months post kyphoplasty. This is the intraop. Um, X-ray, again, as to your question, Dr. Chapman, up to this point, there's no CTs, just MRIs. And un unless I missed it on, on our images, that's why I'm putting the stir because there's no contrast MRI. There's just stir, T T1, T2, and stir MRIs. Uh, I just took a snapshot of the procedure, and uh, I didn't want to put everything in there, but it's just basically the rationale is the, the surgeon decided to do a intertransverse process, posterolateral fusion, um, and um, no instrumentation for, for this case. So let me ask Dr. Plumer here. In your review of the literature, and I know you're going to talk about that article later, have you seen any evidence to suggest that just onlay allograft, bone graft, in a situation where you have an ongoing spine infection that has some instability that has not been uh, disclosed here clearly, but that's clinically inferable, that, that that has any chance for success? No, not really. I, I don't know any data that suggests that this is a good idea. Um, but also, we don't have a lot of evidence. I mean, we always talk about it, that stability uh, is one of the, the main uh, pillars of treating spinal infections, but the evidence isn't that good as well. But clinically, we see that uh, stability is favorable. Uh, instead of going only for a fusion without the instrumentation. So when we talk about stability, what do you use as a criterion? Uh, is it radiographic? Is it clinical? What's in your review of the literature the most preferred way to kind of quantify that? Um, yeah, that's also part of the, the side score, I would say. Um, uh, and if we look at our scoring system, it, it's about location because of the mobi mobility of the spinal segment. Um, which um, yeah also includes the st stability um, and the necessary fixation. It's about radiology, um, but I will talk about it in, in, in my presentation later, uh, what factors we, we included in our side score. And it's also about mechanical instability, like uh, clinical factors like pain, which indicate that there is a mechanical instability. So this is uh, not going well. Rod, you took care of this uh, man and still comment more. Um, did you see any sign that they actually evacuated the psoas abscess? Well, <clears throat> this is an interesting case. Uh, to me, the, the uh, most um, striking thing was the fact that uh, this was going, I think it was a period, almost six months. Yeah, I was going to um, have, I have before I saw him. Yeah. So this is still, uh, you know, yeah. kind of like mid, uh, mid procedure. Exactly. This, this is evolving. to this to yeah. this point. We have no idea about this patient. Yeah. Um, this is. So I, we I went as involved in yeah. this care yeah. until earlier. Yeah. I went as back as possible to just yeah. see the development of of, of this. Um, so at this point, you know, patient has an infection, underwent the discectomy and the posterior lateral um, non instrumented fusion, and he's getting MRIs like every two weeks. He's getting MRIs uh, per um, the infectious disease colleagues at that hospital. So the first one on the left is one week post-op. I, I don't see many changes from the other one. He said, I think it's getting worse, not better. Um, they started antibiotics. 
the, the bacterial cultures did not group anything. He gets another MRI because the patient is almost basically now bedridden because of severe back pain. Um, and as you can see, there's further progression um, of that infection. And then about that time, and I put here just a date, it takes about two weeks or so. Um, I'm glad they actually send it for everything. And then he has uh, TB that is growing from some of the samples. And this MRI, they also noticed that now he's developing a psoas abscess. Where does that psoas abscess come from, Mauricio? Mm, to me, it's from the actual discectomy and just because the psoas is against the, you know, the spine and the disc is just to me contiguous spread. It's a continuity process as opposed to hematogenous. Right. Because the other option is that it's a uh, thromboembolism, a bacterial embolism mm -hmm. of the segmental veins. Okay. And then now we're getting into, let's talk with somebody else. And this is where we start um, getting to know this patient. So once the TB comes up, then they call to another infectious disease specialist who knows about TB. He starts on the uh, TB treatment, the four, the four anti-mycobacterial. Uh, and um, they discontinued the, the uh, other antibiotics because the, their bacteria didn't go grow anything. And then he gets, um, a IR placed catheter into the psoas abscess that you can see here on the MRI. Again, as Dr. Schooner was saying, he's getting basically every three, four weeks MRIs. Um, this is the last MRI before he it gets finally transferred. I put it here. At this moment, he has not been discharged. He's been about two months inpatient in the other facility after the discectomy. And this is the first CT that we have, Dr. Chambin. Yeah, so this is uh, a real problem now. So two months of healthcare resources have been uh, kind of not used well for this patient and he's uh, worsened rather than progressed. As you looked back on the outside medical center's charts, mm -hmm. um, did they ever sample him for AFBs for acid fast bacteria or uh, did they just miss uh, that in their assessment strategy? I, I, I think I think, quote unquote, the lucky part is when they did the discectomy, they send it for everything, which catch the TB. Based on the notes, and granted, I didn't go to every note, but at least the surgical notes and the ID notes, there was not even remotely thinking about TB. I think on the kyphoplasty part, they wasn't even remotely thinking about an infection, um, despite all his medical history, um, which I think it's part of the learning points of, of this case. Yeah, so this is uh, a great case. This is an immune compromised patient, and obviously, looking at AFBs and fungals would have been appropriate right, right. off the bat. Right. Okay, so then this is CT, and then by this time, I think we finally get the call saying this is kind of out of the uh, comfort zone of that other hospital, other surgeon, other team. So he gets transferred to us. But just pointing back, by this time, there's basically near two vertebral bodies destruction. You see part of the vertebral body into the canal, but this time the patient is having some symptoms in his lower extremities. He's, as I said, bedridden, has not been able to mobilize because of severe pain. Um, and the infection is still ongoing. Progression of the MRIs. So uh, once he's here, given again, the persistent infection, severe pain, able to mobilize, and now his progressive deformity, um, we elected to do a stage surgery in order to stabilize his spine, complete a washout, and, um, and perform a reconstruction. So the first stage, which is this post-op CT, was a, a posterior um, fixation with pedicle screws and a wide laminectomy uh, in preparation for stage two that I'm gonna show here in a second. This is a stage two, this is a lateral corpectomy, this is the intra-op uh, pictures. You can see still the cement from like kyphoplasty, the retractor, and then the expandable lateral cage placed after. And this is through a far lateral, an X-lift type approach. Exactly, exactly. With diaphragm takedown or? We went through the chest. Through the chest. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's smart. Yeah. Didn't even try to yeah. stay out of it. Because this was uh, L1, the up top of the top of the infection was already on L1. Um, 
So this is his post-op kind of scout x-ray, post-op CT from stage two. Looks pretty good. Um, unfortunately, three days post-op, he developed uh, some pleural collection. Uh, he had a chest to place uh, that improved, and he was able to be discharged one month after uh, stage two surgery. That, of course, was delayed because of this and finalizing um, his cultures. And the good news is the sample we took here, which is the two and a half months after he started the, the TB treatment, was negative for, uh, for uh, TB. Uh, the, this continued three months post-op. He, he was continuing his rehab. He was doing much better, but then he presented with shortness of breath. Um, he had this pleural effusion again. He underwent a chest tube and the uh, pleurodesis would talk with the thoracic surgeons and that improved quite a bit. And these are the final x-rays that um, we have available. We saw him uh, virtually recently, but we're waiting for a further follow-up with another imaging. So he's, he's doing all, all in all quite well. Uh, he's able to mobilize now um, with, with less pain. He's at home with his family. And as I mentioned, the, the, our cultures, which as you can see, long, long cultures, two months, uh, did not grow any TB. He, um, he has to complete 18 months of anti-TB meds. I look at the ID note just to double check that, but yeah, 18 months, because as you mentioned, Dr. Chapman, he's a pneumonia compromised high risk patient. And this is kind of a summary slide of where he started, how all this developed, the first CT that we have in our final uh, result. Uh, that's an impressive case. I've actually had a patient in my previous life at UW where a patient was treated for compression fractures with kyphoplasties, and the patient was then sent to me because of neurologic deterioration. And when we opened up the patient, we found that the patient had cottage cheese in the epidural space. It was actually TB. Uh, and so th this is actually, I mean, rare, but this is a great case to underscore that. I think it was well managed. Um, Rod, how did you guys manage the TB aspect? Um, there's always a huge hoopla when a patient has TB that yeah. the patient gets obviously put into isolation, but um, he had been exposed or he had exposed multiple people in an outside hospital for a while. And what kind of uh, precautions are taken here? Uh, um, do they get a chest CT to see whether he has productive pulmonary disease? How did they handle yeah, so that? So that's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> what was interesting is if you, so the wife was actually a nurse um, and uh, the history, I think, is really important here. So they're from the Philippines, yeah. and they had traveled. And um, as many of you guys know, it's it's kind of endemic in some areas of the world, including the Philippines. A lot of people just have it. Um, and so I think that was kind of missed. And he didn't really have any history of trauma. So the fact that, you know, again, I think this was an excellent case to show because TB is one of those great... Um, things that people overlook because it mimics infection, tumor, um, and it's not usually in your differential. But um, the question of lung involvement, and I asked Marisa to show that, usually we have the ID folks, we get a chest CT to see if the lungs involved. And regardless of what it shows, people still freak out, right? So everyone's N95, you know, the OR freaks out. We have to be the last case in the, you know, of the day. He actually was, uh, it was almost an emergency urgency to do him just because he progressed. He was starting to have bowel and bladder because he wasn't urinating. It kind of didn't really get picked up. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, so it's always an issue. And then, and then what I wanted to show was that Regardless of whether the CT is negative or not, they're usually, in my experience with TB patients, none of them have normal pulmonary function. And the pulmonary doctors are actually all over this. Um, the ID docs just care whether it's negative or positive in the chest. But they almost always get, regardless of whether you do a lateral or not, they're, they're set up for getting pleural effusions and other things. And when we went in his chest initially, you could actually see there was a big fluid collection there and in the psoas. So there was already starting to develop. Um, there was a pretty sizable fluid collection. Um, and he had trouble with um, uh, his oxygen man was going up. So 
he was kind of a setup for this. Right. And they very commonly, their lungs get very, they almost, um, I wouldn't say get restrictive, but they have a hard time absorbing the pleural fluid. And then they also have a hard time breathing. And so on the chest x-rays, if you watch him, he sort of just starts to go downhill, mainly because of that fluid collection and body can't absorb it. Normally, like the peritoneum, the pleural, one of the um, functions of the pleural cavity is to absorb that fluid. So um, uh, so the OR, the staff, I mean, everyone thinks they're going to get TB. But regardless or not, I think um, in our OR, you have to treat the patient like they have active TB. Mm-hmm. So they don't really care if it's negative or not. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think in, in his case, and I should have put that at the beginning, but he actually, the, his sputum never grew TB. Yeah. Um, he had a prior positive, the quantifying gold test that he underwent for pre-transplant candidacy. But that just means you have a dormant TB, um, like the same, the PPD test type thing. So to your point, he probably had a dormant TB, but he was so immunosuppressed because of his, all his medical problems that this just kind of reactivated the, the TB. And, well, the other thing that's interesting is when you look, so we do a lot of um, thoracic procedures for different pathologies. With TB patients, their lungs are always, when you go in, it's like, um, you know, smokers, they can't inflate. They have restrictive disease. TB is kind of in between where it's, it's, um, it's very spongy and it has a hard time inflating. But then when you ask the um, anesthesiologist to inflate, it doesn't inflate all the way. And then, but you can see that the visceral pleura, it doesn't look normal. Mm-hmm. And typically you can actually divide the visceral pleura uh, from the parietal pleura. In this case, it's all one. Mm-hmm. So it kind of, so when you go through the chest, you're actually going into the uh, visceral pleura as well. So it's kind of a really brutal, and I've, you know, left chest tubes and had, you know, m- almost always they end up seeing thoracic surgery. They get a pleural effusion, they get a chest tube, you know, it's ongoing. And it, usually it takes a couple of years for that to resolve. Um, Dr. Plumer, when you did your study, and you're going to present that shortly, did you include or exclude TB? And is your score applicable to TB or, for instance, fungal osteomyelitis? Yeah, we basically excluded TB and fungal um, infections because they're so different from a, not from a surgical standpoint, but more from an ID standpoint, uh, considering that they, uh, TB cases need like um, um, antibiotic treatment for one and a half years, for example. Um, and this kind of changes um, the approach of treating them for, for me. And so we excluded them for the de novo infection in our side score, but we still don't know if we can extrapolate the score to these situations or not. But yeah, I think kind of a different disease entity when we look at infections. Uh, Rod, I must congratulate you on this case. Um, uh, This was very well done by you. I saw this patient when I covered on weekends, and this was an extremely sick man, and you literally saved a life with spine surgery there. This was a man who was uh, going to die in, in bed in misery. And the other thing what's interesting is it was almost exactly six months to the day that this took for it to kind of evolve. So I think always put TB in your differential. And the history is really important. So so go through the learning job, points Mauricio. there. There's a nice, uh, just go through the learning points because I like that. I have one to add. Um, yeah, no, just looking back at the case, and that's why I went back to like almost a year and a half of his charges. Again, in this very immunosuppressed, multiple medical problems, anxious renal disease patients with, as you were mentioning, Dr. Scuria, and history of travel, high suspicion of infection in the spine, um, that hyperintense signal on the MRI, sure, most of the time it could be a compression fracture, but no history of trauma. It's, you know, the suspicion for the infection should be higher. Um, the second point, which I think we're also going to go to Jonathan talk is, you know, could this, if the surgeon, the initial surgeon decided to place hardware on that first discectomy and do an interbody fusion, you know, and all that. Could all, some of this or all of it could be prevented? That's, I left, i leave that open. And of course, the multidisciplinary approach that is needed for this complex, um, at least on this part of the world, unusual infections uh, to keep these patients alive and, and better. I would add to that two things. Uh, number one, I would 
recommend getting CAT scans yeah. far more often. I mean, from the fracture incidents mm -hmm. to the post-operative uh, unusual deterioration after kyphoplasty was done, the kyphoplasty didn't look very well done either. There's a lot of cement outside of the spine it can happen, but this was more than usual. To then thirdly, um, instability. Again, this shows for me the uh, adversarial relationship of instability and um, of infection, right. and they feed off of one another. The infection creates more instability, instability creates more of an infectious nitus. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a self-serving cycle, right. and I think I see that very well here. And you need to break through that, and again, uh, safety of hardware and infections, uh, safety of surgery, like what Dr. Oskarin just said, with reduced uh, vital capacity of patients, um, very poor nutrition. I, I saw this patient, he was literally skin and bones. Right. So. Right. This was uh, this is a heroic effort, but well done. Thank you for putting that together. Yeah, of course. Last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Schlaudraff, and he's going to take us into a different part of the spine. But the topic today is infections of the spine, and this is again something that's been, I think, severely overlooked, and that in my own lifetime of spine care has gone from a fringe uh, phenomenon to something that uh, certainly in high complexity. Uh, tertiary quaternary practice hospitals has become a daily uh, phenomenon, literally. Yes, I think it's also a good example of a difficult patient population we deal with in Seattle, being uh, the homeless, uh, which have different access to care and more difficult to take care of, particularly with infections that require stuff like IV antibiotics and pick lines and whatnot. Uh, <clears throat> so my case, 40-year-old uh, gentleman, uh, very pleasant. Uh, unfortunately, has a homeless, uh, past medical history of being homeless, uh, living on the street, uh, IV drug abuse, uh, hepatitis C, and a uh, history of recurrent SI joint osteomyelitis since 2020, never completed IV antibiotics. One of the issues is when people get diagnosed with these infections that are non-operative, they get put on IV antibiotics, but they leave against medical advice, don't complete the, the treatment course. So a lot of times these diseases can progress. Uh, so he got, got tried in, on uh, IV antibiotics three different times, uh, but never followed up uh, with his uh, treatments. A lot of times was discharged in either Bactrim or Augmentin, uh, something the PO that which was not sufficient to uh, treat the infection. Ultimately, uh, back uh, this is back in July, uh, presented with worsening uh, left hip pain and inability to walk, and also with uh, uh, fevers. Uh, he was found the ED to have progression of his known left SI joint disease. Uh, you can see there on exam, uh, neurologically intact, no weakness, and you can see he has leukocytosis with the white blood cell count of uh, around 20, and elevated CRP, and hyponatremia, and also uh, blood culture is positive for uh, MRSA. Going to his imaging, uh, you can see a pretty severe infection there of the left SI, SI joint, you can see on the CT. He has pretty wide erosion in the joint. And you can also see that extending up on the left side up to uh, the L5-S1 joint as well, uh, creating a, a disguise there. Uh, also has a psoas abscess uh, venturing out ventral from there uh, as well. Why do patients get infections uh, in the spinal column, and in this case, in the SI joint? What is your thought? Uh, so I think... There's all, usually there's some type of reason, it's either a diabetic or uh, they're on immunosuppressive medications, something. They also be an IV drug abuser using dirty needles. Fortunately, we do have a needle exchange program in Seattle that's underutilized. Uh, but that, so that's a big. Place, why does it go into the spine and what, what areas in the spine does it like to hit? Uh, I think probably the spine's a very vascular organ. Uh, lots of blood flow through there. Uh, you also have a plexus, which uh, stuff kind of might fall with gravity down to the, the bottom, to the SI joint, I guess. Bob, this is your patient. Why do you think the spine, like the SI joint, gets infected? Any thoughts on that? This is so weird. I mean, and obviously, whatever, all the things that Dr. Schlaudorf has mentioned are correct. It's a very vascular structure, has a lot of end capillaries uh, where bacterial emboli can seed, but like, why the SI joint? Yeah, it's a good question. I, you know, I think SI joint is relatively rare, right? And that was the first, I believe, the first locus of infection in this gentleman. Um, you know, the discs, it's a different issue. So the discs are heavily vascularized 
externally and uh, avascular internally. So they, they're kind of a, a perfect place for bacteria to find a home and our immune systems just don't reach there uh, once they get inside the disc. So we were talking yesterday or Sunday, I guess, the, we had a large disc herniation. And so the intervertebral discs and the eyeball are the two largest avascular structures in the human body. Great point. I personally add to this um, uh, inflammatory disease. If these are very degenerative segments, uh, this can harbor um, uh, or be a nidus uh, for bacteria just to seed in. It's again just uh, aplastic tissue, uh, fluid, and a really inflammatory environment that can't defend itself uh, due to the fluid pocket uh, against an infection once bacteria get in there. Yeah, if they have an underlying sacroiliitis, yeah. could be a breeding ground for it. Uh, so the question is, what do we do for this? Do you try to wash it out and do another round of IV antibox and hope he stays in the hospital? Uh, or do you have to Dr. Plumo, without taking aggressive? a talk away, uh, any idea that you look at the SI joints also? Is that outside of your purview? Um, yeah, a little bit, but I mean, uh, the, mm, there are some, yeah. Good facts. I mean, uh, we can talk about the SI joint as a, a separate joint in, instead of talking about it as part of the spine. So maybe it's a good idea to to do a two-stage procedure, but it might be also a good idea to to add stability in this case, uh, even though uh, the the weight bearing is possible after this. So um, looking at fractures, for example, we would add stability. So I would do the same in this case, like. Uh, adding stability, debridement, irrigation, and then treat the patient uh, with weight bearing. Dr. Sohail, Tarek, uh, you had your hand raised. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, I think one of the reasons for um, the spine and the sacro to be involved in our setup is that apart from uh, comorbid conditions like diabetes and um, uh, you know, poor immune system because of various reasons, is a recurrent UTI, low-grade infection, or the genitourinary tract infection, which is not uncommon. And um, a retroperitoneal area, which is, you know, direct in communication uh, with these um, spinal um, uh, bits and plexus and etc. There is no valve there, and you can have a bacteremia there from uh, lower GI and uh, lower uh, genitourinary, especially in the female and also in the male. And um, don't forget that uh, there are a lot of people in our setup, they have a history of um, tuberculosis infection in the pulmonary setup, and they may have a reactivation because of other reasons and may have a bacteremia there. So I think uh, a recurrent low-grade infection in the lower urinary tract or the genital urinary tract or the GI tract is one of the possibility, and it is there in most of the patients. They inoculate themselves into the um, uh, through the basin plexus, uh, retroperitoneal extension of the various veins and etc. And they uh, inoculate there in the SI joint or in the uh, spinal area, and they uh, do develop an nidus and supplementary um, uh, secondary infection, and uh, all the cascade of inflammation and uh, sequestration etc. Ultimately, deformation there. Uh, I agree that you should be uh, ruling out that there is no um, uh, inflammatory disorder like uh, enclosing spondylitis, but that should happen in the both sides and that should not produce any um, any uh, sort of uh, pus. And I think uh, I won't hesitate to do a biopsy there under local anesthesia to rule out any tissue diagnosis, any other diagnosis apart from infection, tuberculosis or otherwise uh, uh, in that um, uh, in mm -hmm. that situation. So we're very honored. I'm seeing on our many guests today and attendees, Dr. Ehud Mendel, um, uh, uh, the Vice Chair of Neurosurgery at uh, Yale, and uh, Dr. Bazem Ishak, uh, Chief of Spine at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, if they want to switch over to the panel um, group, doc, this goes to Dr. Robert Huang. Also, I'll ask Angela and Ben to help with that. Uh, Abe, take us forward, please. Yeah. Um, so the question was, what would all we treat? Uh, we decided to address both the uh, L5 S1 discitis and the uh, left side SI joint dysfunction. So we ended up doing an L5 to pelvis. Uh, here you can see interop films. Uh, before we started, we had the patient promised us he would complete his IV antibiotics inside the hospital, which of course went the same way as the uh, three prior times. So uh, a post-op, uh, he was admitted to the wards and uh, left AMA, uh, 
had his pick line removed, took Augmentin, did complete Zambonics, and actually he just show, showed up um, back two months later in the ED with a drug overdose, and since then has been lost to, lost to follow up. So it's a difficult patient population to kind of take care of, but something we see quite a bit in Seattle, unfortunately. So do we have a final CT? Uh, we got one post-op CT. Uh, we have no x-rays. He uh, he left the hospital AMA and what has not come back. What did joint? Uh, a chat bone modification. Uh, drilled it out, right? I was inside the surgery, but I think bird, bird it out and put in a, a strut mm -hmm. to fuse it. So Dr. Hart, so um, one nice iliac post screw, it looks like a long screw. Uh, why not two screws? And what do you do for the SI joint? Yeah, we stabilize this just with one iliac screw. And it, he, uh, you know, in, in retrospect, I mean, we begged this guy to stay in house and, and he promised he would, of course, and then, uh, and then failed to do so. So I think, with persistent infection without adequate treatment, no amount of fixation is going to hold forever, probably. Maybe he goes ahead and autofuses it, I don't know. But we, my approach to these is to burr them out as a, you know, thoroughly burr out the SI joint and then pack both morselized graft and BMP and then uh, structural pieces, usually of uh, fibular graft that we cut and wedge in sort of like a corpectomy graft in the cervical spine. So. That's what we did for this gentleman, but yeah, I haven't seen him since he left the hospital. Yeah, there's no notes since I just checked since August. Yeah, I saw that Dr. Ishak is on. Uh, Baz, uh, happy New Year! Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, any thoughts on this case and SI joint arthritis? Have you seen as many infections, um, de novo spinal column infections in Heidelberg as we have here in uh, Seattle? Uh, yeah, first of all, Happy New Year um, and thanks for having me. Um, actually, um, we see many um, spine infections and we do see SI joint infections too. Um, I think um, we also do see very and many elderly patients and they all have somehow degeneration at the SI joints. And I think what we discussed before, this is an area um, where infection loves to be. Um, in terms of Infection in general compared to the US, we don't have that many issues with IV drug abuse, for instance, and uh, nutrition problems compared to the US. I think this is the main thing. It's good to see you. Thank you for joining us. You look great. So now you've done a lot of work in this space also, and uh, we're looking forward to your commentary. And thank you for joining us today. And we have some exciting research ideas that you've proposed recently, so I want to uh, talk about that later. But uh, Dr. Plumer has been a research fellow with us uh, over the last year and a half, and he's from uh, Bergmanns Heil. This is the oldest trauma center in the world in Bochum, Germany, northern Germany. And he's done a terrific job uh, kind of providing a structural analysis on spine infections as an overlooked entity within the general realm of our field. Uh, he is a trauma surgeon by background. He's going to go back as an attending uh, on the trauma service, but again, in Germany, they treat spine conditions also, because the spine surgeons don't want to be woken up at night. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Outside of Dr. Ishak. Um, and he's, he's going to provide kind of a summary of his uh, structured analysis of what we should know and what we currently know and what we don't know about spine infection. So thanks for your work, Jonathan. We're looking forward to your summary lecture on de novo spine infections. Yeah, uh, thank you for the kind introduction and for your words. Uh, it was my pleasure, you heard it already, that uh, I had a full year of spine research here at the uh, Swedish Neuroscience Institute and uh, the Seattle Science Foundation. And I'm mainly focused on spinal infections and uh, especially on de novo spinal infections and I will give you an ov overview of my scientific work here in Seattle. So um, it was kind of hard to limit it down to like 30 minutes but uh, I tried it so uh, you, you will see a lot of numbers, you will see a lot of studies but um, I think and I hope it's an interesting way to look at spinal infections. Um, even though I know that, uh, that a lot of surgeons don't want to treat surgical infections and um, yeah, but I will start with a quick case because we have said talks, 
So we'll, I will show a quick case and then we come back uh, after my presentation to the case. So this is a 39 year old male with osteoarthritis T910 and an epidural abscess of T8 to T10. He was neurologically intact on admission and got worse over the night, ending up with a loss of function of the right lower extremity, severe weakness on the left side and numbness uh, with a cumulative ASIA score of 74. And the CT showed some bony erosion of T910 and the MRI showed the epidural abscess with compression of the spinal cord. Just think about uh, your treatment approach for this uh, patient. I will come back to this patient after my presentation. So let's start very classic and look at the epidemiology of spinal infections. I don't want to make this too boring, but the overall incidence is not very high. It's low with 2.2 of 100,000 uh, people, but there's a bimodal age peak. Uh, the first around 20 years of age and the second uh, around like 50 to 70 years of age, reaching an age-adjusted incidence of up to 30 to um, 250,000 patients. The incidence nearly doubled over 10 years. That's, uh, the, these are um, data from France from 2010, uh, 2010 to 2019, um, yeah, nearly doubled and patients over 65 are affected uh, 3.5 times more, and men are also affected two times more. So among all of these uh, patients with spinal infection, we see a lot of patients with diabetes, a lot of immune, immune, immunosuppression uh, patients, and also a lot of IV drug abusers, and we already saw that in our cases. The problem for uh, spinal infections start with uh, the terminology of the spinal infections. There's no clear language talking about this, they are, grouped, they, they are grouped like for uh, their location, for the root of infection, and also for the origin. So this heterogeneity limits the scientific approach and the scientific uh, evaluation, and also limits the resulting treatment uh, recommendations for the spinal infections. So I will give you my preferred way of thinking about spinal infection. It starts with the origin of the infections, meaning are, there, are we talking about the de novo infection, uh, or are we talking about um, yeah, a secondary infection, like a post-surgical infection, and then looking for the location, is it a discitis, is it a spondylodiskitis, is, is it an epidural abscess? And after this, yeah, uh, we can look at the root of infection, but uh, mainly this is not, yeah, one of the most important treatment relevant considerations for us as surgeons. So speaking about de novo infections, what makes them special? They are the most common type of spinal infections and their treatment differs from the treatment of the secondary non-de novo infections. While the treatment standard for secondary infections, and we already talked about this, uh, is a combination of surgical treatment and antibiotics, most de novo infections, and that means 60 to 90 uh, to 95 percent in the literature are treated non-surgically. And we will talk about the question of this treatment approach is really up to date concerning the evidence in the literature. And the incidence, uh, or this includes a surgical intervention rate up to 50% in this cohort of uh, non-surgical treated patients. So one of the questions we will talk about and we will work on uh, in my presentation is if surgery is only the second line therapy for de novo infections or if this is not up to date. But let's start with the essentials. De novo infections are predominantly monobacterial infections. The most common source is genitourinary, followed by endocarditis and soft tissue infections. And the most common bacteria is Staph aureus. This also includes MRSA, but we also see Streptococcus, Enterococcus infections, and also E. coli infections. I excluded TB um, cases, which um, yeah, seem to be the most predominant infection in other parts of the world, like Eastern Europe, or if we look at India. But we have evidence from other fields of surgical interventions like revisional joint arthroplasties that there might be difficult to treat bacteria. And um, this is for like streptococcus and enterococcus infections. But do we have evidence for this in spinal infections? Uh, only very limited so far. There's only one publication addressing this question of uh, difficult to treat uh, bacteria by Yaktiran et al. And this publication included 130 patients um, comparing treatment failure for staph aureus. This also included MRSA compared to co a combined group of enterococcus and streptococcus. But their uh, analysis showed that uh, staph aureus was an independent risk factor for failure. 
but looking now at our own data, this is still still ongo an ongoing retrospective cohort study we do here with a more detailed subdivision of the bacteria subdividing MRSA, MSSA, and including 150 patients in total, um, showing that MRSA, Enterococcus, and Streptococcus infections showed a higher failure rate, which was significant for MRSA and Streptococcus. Uh, so yes, they are difficult to treat bacteria, but we are still figuring out which ones in the spine and uh, why the pole position seems to go to MRSA, Streptococcus, and Enterococcus. But are there known possible causes of this problem that some infections have a higher treatment failure? Uh, one possible explanation is the formation of biofilm. We know it. Both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria can form biofilm. And if we look at the biofilm-forming bacteria and this list there, we can see that uh, the list matches with the most common bacteria we see for the novo spinal infections. So if we furthermore look at uh, or for possible antibiotics active against biofilm formation, we end up with a gap for streptococcus and enterococcus infections, since we only have rifampicin for staph infections, and we have, um, yeah, ciprofloxacin for the complex of gram-negative infections, which might state that streptococcus and enterococcus are difficult to treat because of the uh, not existing antibiotics for biofilm. But we always spoke about surgical treatment for the novo infections historically being second line uh, option. But looking for common indications for surgical treatment in the literature, we find like failure for non-surgical treatment, no resolution of symptoms, instability, cord compression, and progressive deficits, uh, and yeah, as treatment indications. But looking at this list has always left me back with a lot of uh, questions, like what defines failure for non-surgical treatment? Which symptom symptoms are we talking about? What is spinal instability in infections? What kind of progression of neurological deficits is indicated for surgical care? And once again, looking at the literature and the recent evidence, we pretty much find no real answers to all of these questions uh, for the novel infections. So there is a high need for treatment guidance for spinal infections, and especially for the novel spinal infections. And using classification system or a scoring system uh, as a tool, uh, guide treatment decisions can lower physician-related rela biases and this includes surgeons who always want to operate and ID doctors who mainly want to stay with antibiotics. And, but the existing classifications we have out here and the existing scoring systems ended, ended up being not comprehensive enough, focusing only on special indications like instability for, for spondylodiscitis, uh, missing factors like neurology or uh, comorbidities and have a lack of reliability or just represent the opinion of single experts rather than a multidisciplinary expert panel. So we came up with the idea of uh, the side score and we used an evidence approach process combining reviews and proven key elements of uh, other scoring system and classification systems and obtaining expert panel input following a Delphi process done by a multidisciplinary panel, not only by one or two senior authors. So. We ended up with the side score being a comprehensive evidence-based approach to the treatment decision problem in DNSI. And I will talk about uh, the side score now. We included five main components which are addressed stepwise, starting with neurology. And this uh, factor has an opt-out criteria um, of acute plegia due to the infection, going on with the location of the infection, radiology uh, changes to the to radiology due to the infection, pain as a mechanical in indicator for instability, and patient-related comorbidities. And the lower the score, the more severe the spinal infection, ending up with a classification of three groups and giving you a treatment recommendation of surgical or non-surgical treatment. And we I already talked about this, we included the SIN score uh, location definition, which already includes a possible instability judgment within the distribution of junctional, mobile, semi-rigid or rigid lesions. Going on, furthermore, we included a checklist-like tool for radiology uh, changes, which uses both CT and MRI images. We already talked about it. And there's evidence that we, use, that we should use CT and MRI images in, in infections, uh, judging the impingement of central neural elements, segmental angulation and translation, erosion and edema, as well as integrity of the post elements. And as as you can see, the, the attached list should only give you an idea of the evidence behind all these factors 
But if you look closely, and if you already, we already talked about this problem, instability for a spinal infection has no clear definitions. So, and there's no in investigation on the problem of instability in infections. So we extrapolated given factors uh, from trauma and oncological cases and tried to define spinal instability for spinal infections as a loss of spinal integrity from infectious process associated with or without neural element impingement, symptomatic or progressive deformity, pain associated with mechanical loading or inability to emblead. And this is addressed by the location, radiology, and the pain component in the side score. Furthermore, we included intravenous drug abuse and diabetes as comorbidities because there's evidence for higher treatment failure of medical treatment for a diabetes DNSI patients. Furthermore, there was a higher failure rate for uh, IVDA DNSI patients with a higher probability of surgical intervention and a better neurological recovery for IVDA patients after surgical intervention compared to non-IVDA patients. We also included a reliability analysis in our study on a representative cohort of 30 de novo infection patients and showing nearly perfect ICCs, uh, high intra-observer reliability, and as well as high uh, sensitive sensitivity and specificity values. Now that we have an idea of the treatment decision of surgical or non-surgical uh, treatment, what are the goals of surgical treatment? It's about the direct debridement, the direct decompression, it's about the decreasing the de or decreasing the pain, retain stability, and ensure blood perfusion. And is surgery able to, to achieve this, or does surgery expose the patient to higher primary failure rates, higher reinfection rates, higher reoperation rates, or readmission rates, uh, which is frequently stated by our non-surgical colleagues or ID doctors? And furthermore, is instrumentation a problem in active de novo spinal infections? To answer this question, we uh, follow up with a, uh, yeah, with a systematic review. We just recently published this one in the Global Spine Journal. So once again, open access for all of you. Primary outcomes were a comparison of instrumented to non-instrumented surgery for the novel spinal infections, including infection recurrence, reoperation, primary failure, mortality, and length of stay. Secondary objectives were outcome, outcomes for surgical and non-surgical treatment for the novel infections, including recurrence of infection, mortality, quality of life, and length of stay. We include 17 studies and over 2,000 patients for, with the novel infections. The mean age was 63, uh, 61 patients were male. We um, yeah, concluded two comparison groups. Uh, the first one was the comparison of non-surgical to surgical treatment and the second group was uh, instrumented versus non-instrumented surgery for de novo spinal infections. And let's take a look at our meta-analysis for recurrence of infection. And the analysis shows no difference for the overall odds ratios for instrumented or no, uh, non-instrumented surgery. And there was also no difference for or between surgical and non-surgical treatment in terms of recurrence of infection. Or differently spoken, surgery also including instrumented surgery sh showed no higher risk of recurrence of infection compared to non-surgical or non-instrumented surgery. What about primary failure, uh, which was defined as patients who needed surgical debridement after surgical intervention uh, after, uh, or before completion of the antibiotic treatment? There was no difference for the overall ratios for primary failure and, uh, of instrumented versus non-instrumented surgery. And let's do a small excurs here. Uh, we are still working on a retrospective cohort analysis of our DNSI patients. It was not part of the review, but we could show that uh, there was a higher primary failure rate for non-surgical treatment compared to surgical treatment, including 180 patients or 176 patients with a minimum follow-up for one year, but there was no difference in the overall um, and the overall failure rate. This is still ongoing, but we will probably publish this in the future. So back to the review, looking at the reoperation weights. Um, in this case, instrumented versus non-instrumented surgery. Interestingly, we can see that there is a significantly lower ratio for instrumented surgery compared to non-instrumented surgery in terms of reoperation rates for the novo spinal infections. We also looked at mortality rates and there was no difference in mortality for surgical versus non-surgical treatment. But we can see a significantly lower odd ratio for mortality rates in, for instrumented compared to non-instrumented surgery in this uh, slide. In, an interesting excuse again, and this, is, this one is again ongoing, ongoing study. We looked at national data as well. 
And um, this national data uh, based on the energy database of 2018 showed that the odd, ratio, odd ratios for readmissions were significantly lower for surgical compared to a non-surgical treatment of spinal infections. This is not only based on the novo infections, but this already shows the, the impact of surgical treatment when we, when we look at spinal infections. This also included uh, non-fusion and fusion, fusion uh, surgery. Once again, we probably publish our data in the near future. That's at least the, the aim. But back to the review, we were furthermore able to show that the quality of life components, and in this uh, case, pain and uh, physical activity, were significantly higher in the group of surgical treated patients compared to non-surgical treatment, including pain and physical activity. And this was based on SF36 data uh, and yeah, the visual, uh, visual analog scale for pain. So let's just summarize our results so far. First of all, the novo infections remain underserved by the spine community. The decision-making process for uh, definitive treatment for uh, de novo spinal infection is difficult, but the scoring system, like the side score or even the side score classification or side score, um, can help guide the treatment for de novo spinal infections. And maybe in further, uh, with further investigation, we can show that it's even a guidance for, let's say, post surgical infections. The best surgical intervention without targeted antibiotic uh, treatment, and we see this for like biofilm formation and a proper follow-up is set up to fail. That's more my personal opinion than rather than evidence-based. I think that's, that's one of the main points I wanted to point out. Surgery for DNSI seems safe without a higher reinfection or mortality rate compared to non-surgical treatment. Uh, instrumented surgery for de novo spinal infections compared to non-instrumented surgery seems to be safe with lower reoperation rates and lower uh, mortality rates and uh, better outcomes and quality of life concerning pain, con concerning physical activities seem possible with surgical treatment compared to non-surgical treatment. So let's get back to the case once again, 39 year old male, and no diabetes, no drug abuse, um, discitis T9 to T10, epidural abscess T8 to T10 um, with severe weakness uh, and the, uh, yeah, yeah, and an ongoing problem. What, what would be your treatment approach? I think we have some minutes left to talk about it. Maybe you can ask, ask the panel. All right, a really nice job. So first of all, a round of applause. Let's go to our international panel. Let's have Dr. Ishak from Heidelberg uh, weigh in first. So you saw the um, CT and the MRI scan. First of all, is that the norm now in Heidelberg? Uh, do you get a CT and an MRI? For some reason, people have just become obsessed with MRIs only and think that that's cool. So tell us a little bit about your diagnostic approach. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Plummer, for this great presentation. Um, in terms of CT, we actually became really aggressive the past years because um, we, of course, learned our lessons. Um, some bony erosions were overseen because we always have the discussion with our radiologists, is this a de degenerative process? Is this osteochondrosis or is this discitis? Especially what we do see is like a silent discitis. So the patient comes in with back pain, no infection parameters, no fever. So um, therefore, we always go for CT to see some bony erosions. And then it seems clear for us that this might be some infectious disease. So always do a CT scan. Uh, lab parameters, do you have something in Germany that goes beyond CRP, SED rate? Do you still get both? Uh, do you get nutritional panels on these patients who are frequently compromised to help understand what their immune competency will be? Yeah, um, we sometimes, but not often, do albuminia, but it's not like a general assessment tool here in Germany. Um, but what we do is like a PCT, procalcitonin. We also started to do a study on that. Is this like more sensitive compared to CRP or leukocytes? But um, we came to the result that it doesn't matter. So this will not help you. It costs money, but it will not help you do it. So, so we actually do not have like... Um, a tool, a special tool. Yeah, that's it's still CRP, leukocytes, and clinical symptomatic. 
that's a good point. That's that's why we we didn't include it in the in the site score. We we thought about it, but we actually did not find very specific evidence that there is a good indicator looking for CAP or whatever PCT. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now to the case, Baz. So this patient has discitis, no neurology, but can mobilize. Well, he has neurology. Twelve severe neurology. Uh, oh, he has severe neurology. Yep. Sorry, I missed that somehow. Yeah. Uh, risk factors are what? Uh, basically, he only is a smoker. That's his own. Uh, this is a risk factor. It's not part of the side score, but uh, concerning the side score, he doesn't really have uh, any risk factors. Yeah. So, what was the neurology again? Sorry, I totally missed that. Yeah, he had a plegia on the right lower extremity and with a severe weakness on the left side. So, with that, Buzz, is it a foregone conclusion that you, as the head of your spine unit, and Heidelberg will proceed to surgery, is that correct? Absolutely correct, and I give you an example. Um, we actually had so many patients past year um, where we do not had any instability, where you could clearly say, okay, we can try to do um, a conservative treatment, but I haven't seen any patient, not a single one, who went well with antibiotic therapy only. So, and um, MIS is, for me, not an option, like just like to do some decompression, get the whatever germ or whatever, do a washout. So stabilization is always indicated. Great. So you take this patient to the operating room. And so hardware, are you comfortable putting hardware into an active infection now? I know all of us, when we were raised as younger doctors, were told don't put hardware into an infection. Are we well past that now? Are you convinced by the nice presentation by Jonathan that shows that's actually a good thing to put hardware into infections? Yes, we always do so. And um, we do not have any doubts to do so because what's the option for the patient? Like if you do not put instrumentation, I have the feeling even if you do the washout as good as well that you will not get silence into that area. So it has to be stabilized and we did also surgery without stabilization and months later they came back with new deformity or new instability or um, more obsessed formations. Yep. All right, so take us forward, Jonathan, what was done? So let's uh, look at the case. Uh, we did uh, laminectomy T5 to T11, lavage irrigation debridement, interbody fusion with a peak cage. That's a little debatable when we look at the literature because uh, peak might be inferior to titanium. But um, yeah, patient was doing well. He was stabilized and um, his further follow-up six months post-op showed a yeah, basically good clinical follow-up. Why so many levels? I mean, it, it's about, it's not a very uh, mobile part of the spine, but I think it's, it's a good idea uh, to, to go for, for longer instrumentation in this case. It's debatable if you have to do like four levels above and uh, below, but I think it's a good idea for, to go for longer construct, yeah. Uh, so do you have any thoughts about uh, biomaterials for cages? Should we use allograft? Uh, is peak okay? Uh, we are obviously increasingly worried that it creates a biofilm, and Jonathan very nicely showed why biofilms are bad. Is titanium the ideal uh, anterior column support? Actually, we know the biofilm problem with peak cages, and if we do like... Um um microscopical assessment we clearly see that this always creates a biofilm i have the feeling it does not have some clinical consequence it does not look good but it's okay i mean i would like to have like for me personally like for the cervical especially like peak i know there might be biofilm but i can do better follow-up images so this is my strategy now you've published on area also, just like what Jonathan did. Jonathan took a bigger picture perspective, but you looked at MRSA and staff and everything. What are your thoughts on, does the uh, microorganism actually matter and are some worse than others? Um, absolutely, we do see more resistances, um, especially when we do see more infections. And our question, like, well, when we did the study, this was like de novo spinal infection, MRSA versus MSSA to see does this have some problems for the patients? Is the the patient outcome is this bad? Um, do we have more implant failures? 
uh, does the patient have more neurological deficits? And we, we screened actually four and a half thousand patients. And what we did see that uh, like patients with MRSA um, have um, a problem with some renal functions, like renal insufficiency seems to be a factor for that. And malnutrition, of course. And these were the two factors, what we could see significantly between both groups, sensitive versus resistance. Great. So um, I, I don't know who, uh, who wants to comment. Uh, Rod, do you think there's too many levels in retrospect? I don't know who did this case yeah. from us. What are your thoughts on this case? What would you say? So with Staph aureus, this is a patient with neurologic deficit. Um, he was treated for a while non-surgically again, right? Uh, yeah, but not long because of the, the neurological deficits. Yeah. What are your thoughts in retrospect on this case without knowing who the yeah. attending was? I mean, I think, you know, again, having been involved in thoracic cases that have gone bad with decompressions only, I think with mid-thoracic, you know, watershed area, it's kind of tricky. I think, you know, I don't think you can do a small one level. Um, and, uh, you know, again, um, I think, uh, you know, your work, Jonathan, is really um, uh, outstanding because infections have become more and more of an issue. And, um, you know, again, for various reasons, you know, and, um, uh, you know, whether it's IV drug abuse, you know, the, I think, um, you know, if you look in America, like, obesity, type 2 diabetes, these are all, everything's getting worse. You know, people are getting bigger and bigger, and we're starting to see complications and infections I've never seen before in my career. So I think the question here is not how many levels to me. It's um, the fact that the patient was fused, stabilized, and doing well neurologically. Correct. For me, you know, okay, let's say if you save two levels, it doesn't really, to me, make that much of a difference. I think the big difference here, and I've seen this, we showed some cases where, you know, someone goes and does a one level laminectomy and says, oh, yeah, you know, and then the patient deteriorates, falls apart. So I think stabilizing, realignment, decompression, all the things you talked about in your wonderful work, you know, I think these are all important, getting a diagnosis. So. Dr. Hart, does it matter to you if an abscess uh, or a pathologic lesion is in cord bearing versus lumbar levels? Should we have an equal, uh, all neurology aside, an equal concern for the uh, non cord bearing areas, or does your threshold towards surgery just immediately change once cord bearing levels are affected? Well, yes, I think the cord always uh, changes the dynamic and the decision making uh, and raises the acuity of. Uh, intervention and um, you know I would I would agree with uh, comments Rod just made I think reading this uh, the reason it looks to me that the reason the surgeon uh, went up to t5 is because he had to do a laminectomy that high also to decompress the yep. the abscess uh, I think if this was just a mechanical issue I would probably have done three above three below uh, <laughs> but having a laminectomy above a construct like that would would not be optimal so include and I agree with what Rod said that taking another couple of thoracic levels isn't going to functionally impair this patient and um, yeah so one thing I would uh, underline is I do think there are patients if we get in early enough uh, that don't require uh, radical inner body stabilization. So uh, if the disc is not yet eroded um, severely and we're treating an epidural abscess, yeah. I think you can do a laminectomy and uh, potentially just do percutaneous screws and the, yep. the infection will spontaneously uh, fuse in many of those cases. So there are some, I think, that we can be a little less radical in our treatment. Yep. Uh, but all in all, I think, uh, as everyone has said, uh, our, the the uh, structural instability that this is causing in so many of these patients is requiring uh, okay. an increasing uh, intensity of surgical treatment. Yeah, and good and I think in many cases, the earlier, the better. Before I ask Dr. Ishak to close us out, um, uh, Tarek, uh, uh, what do you think about the site score? Is this something that you're interested in? Would this help your decision-making and your uh, patient clientele in Pakistan? Well, I think uh, uh, the uh, 
the, I think uh, they've done a good job. The basic principle, uh, I would say, is that uh, IV antibiotics uh, stabilization. In this case, I think uh, there was instability because there was intra-ossia sepsis and there was uh, erosion of the two adjacent vertebrae. And I think uh, that needed uh, some stabilization and some decompression as well, which they have done very well. And I think uh, you don't have to go over all the four level above and below. I think uh, in my situation, I would have done just two level above and two below and uh, put some um, uh, cage in the front uh, after thorough debrima. I think the debrima is most important. Uh, you have to clean all the area, leave the area which is uh, good and healthy looking. And uh, at the same time, you take culture and uh, um, do uh, necessary, uh, you know, antibiotics. Um, I, I I don't, uh, you know, this is one of the options is you people think that uh, you put antibiotic loaded cement, but I don't think that that's a good idea. I think it's better to use uh, titanium uh, cages. Uh, they don't invite any uh, biofilm and um, they provide stability and uh, and uh, they, they, they allow some, uh, you know, uh, bony growth around the implant and uh, you don't have to uh, put any uh, allograft or uh, autograft uh, in that uh, area, which is still potentially infected after debris. So I think uh, by and large, I think they have done a good, they have done uh, a good job. And uh, um, I really appreciate uh, that uh, um, they, uh, they, they stabilized the whole situation, but I think uh, maybe four level above and below, they were a little uh, more than but to my mind, it is uh, probably not necessary. I would have done two levels above and two below. Great maximum uh, three above and below. Yeah. And greetings to Dr. Harshad Parekh from Mumbai. Thank you for joining us also. Uh, so uh, we obviously are very biased because uh, we really liked this work. It's very helpful for us and it'll um, help as a resource to talk to our, our ID doctors. Dr. Ishak, you're a big picture guy and uh, you've assumed the leadership role in the Deutsche Wirbelsäulengesellschaft, the DVG now. Congratulations on that. Um, so tell us your perspective on does a site score like this help us in our clinical decision making? Uh, can this serve as a communication tool? Uh, can this improve patient care? And so just again, thanks for joining us from Germany. Yeah, thanks for the great session. And again, Dr. Plummer, thank you very much for this great score. Um, some people say it's just a score. I say um, it's a helpful tool, uh, not only for me, for my department. We I have like many, like over 30 residents and 12 attendings working with us. So it's always, um, it always simplifies things. Let's say like that. We have a score. We say it's like A, B and Z, and this is how we do. And this is how it goes. And um, on the other hand, it's always a good tool, like for other departments, departments of like for the ED doctors, for the um, infection disease doctors, like to communicate on, at the same level and we say okay we have this patient we have this score so in our opinion and like what the literature said this patient is unstable or might be might have problems with stability so we would recommend surgery because here we always have to discuss do we have to do surgery do we have to do it at 3 a.m in the morning um like many discussions and this simplifies things and you know the germans love to discuss a lot of things unnecessarily so um, the other question which arise in my opinion, and this is like one of our focuses is like to work with elderly and very elderly patients. I mean, um, sometimes when we are on calls, we like see like 10 patients over 80 like with different spinal diseases, like just in one day. And the question is if we like include age to that score, like if over 65 or 70 over 80, like we know the patients have more comorbidities, does this affect the score? Like, do we have to be even more aggressive with those patients? On the other hand, the complication rate might be high. So this is like the question I would have in terms of the side score. Yep, great. Jonathan, terrific. Thank you so much for your great presentation yeah. and work. And thank you all for joining us around the world. It's so thank good you, to see you. Happy New Year, happy, healthy uh, New Year, and let's keep working together. Take care.